Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Too Scared to Sleep. I'm your favorite host, Dylan. Just because I'm looking at my phone doesn't mean you can steal our intro. Yeah, well, I'm stealing the fucking intro, so. Hi, how's it going? There's the other one, Jake. We were waiting for you to be here earlier, and now you're trying to act like you're all on top of things. I am. I'm going to dive right in here and say that I am so excited because not only are we on Anchor.fm, but we are on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Breaker, CastBox, Overcast, Pocket Casts, Radio Public, and Stitcher. Hell yeah. Holy shit balls. Hell yeah. The fact that we can go on to Spotify, I was just like so excited about that. And we're on Spotify, that just makes me so excited. So much. I know. Everyone uses Spotify. That's what I use for all of my podcasting needs. Spotify, please sponsor us. But yeah, I'm just, I'm really excited that we're on more platforms now. All the episodes are available, so yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's really cool. We're getting a system worked out. We're actually having some semblance of professionalism, so maybe we'll be there one day. <laughs> are we? Until we open our mouths. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah, very excited about that. Let's see. Oh, I was <clears> going <throat> to tell you, what movies have we seen? This is the thing we always talk about because we end up seeing a lot of movies. We saw Halloween. We saw Halloween. It was what okay. What a good movie. I liked it a lot. Did you like it that much? I liked it a lot. I don't know. I never I give saw it, the original. I give it four dead bodies out of five. I had never seen the original, so in Which is wild to me. Yeah, I know. Just, I don't know. If it had come on at some point during the holiday season, I probably would have seen it. It was on all over the place. AMC was doing a whole marathon. I bro, I don't have cable. Oh, my God. Anyway. Oh, yeah. In preparation of seeing that movie, I watched a five-minute recap of the original Halloween movie. So I felt like I saw enough of it to realize some of the illusions and the Easter eggs and the callbacks Yeah. to the original movie. But I thought it was really good. The kills were a lot of fun. It was... A really fun movie, but also just pretty good. I, I liked it a lot. I watched a movie at home, Terrifier. Oh, that one on Netflix, right? Yeah, the one with Art the Clown. Oh, yeah. That one was not bad. Gross, right? Some of the kills were pretty cool, but also there was it was real cheesy. It was kind of like a uh, homage to 70s, 80s slasher stuff, but it, it was pretty good, but... Speaking of Netflix and watching things, aside from movies, I've been watching The Haunting of Hill House, which is really good. I haven't heard nothing but good things about that. Oh, I know. But admittedly, I was kind of skeptical because not all the Netflix originals have been a game here recently. But We're looking at you, Iron Fist. <laughs> looking at you, Iron Fist. No, but Haunting of Hill House is super good and like really tense. And I don't really get scared by horror movies or anything, but this one's gotten close. It gets in your head, man. It's really good. Does it? I yeah, see it's it. it's real tense. The acting is good. It's got an actor that I really like. Dario Naharis. Yeah. Oh, that I'm guy. sure. He's a dreamboat. Yeah, I mean... Hi! So we took a little break because we got interrupted by Annabelle's lover again. Again with the lover stuff. Anyway... Yeah, so you were watching The Haunted in, Haunting of Hill House. I've heard it was really good. Yeah, it is really good. I have not started it yet because it's one of those ones where I want to watch on the, the big TV in the living room. And Yeah, I finally you know. got a big TV in my room, which I'm really happy about. But when I started watching Haunting of Hill House, I got home from work one day. So I just like flipped it on and then I looked over and it was two in the morning and I was like halfway done. Nah. So I was like, oh, okay, oh, shit. All right, well, this is what we're doing now. Enough of that, right? Oh, yeah. We watched Shin Godzilla. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, Shin Godzilla. Shin Godzilla. And I say we because we share a voodoo account. Mm-hmm. And we so, share my voodoo account. Yes, we share your voodoo account. Whatever. We're going steady. It's fine. Stop. Anyway, I watched it and then Jake watched it. And it was okay, except it was weird because the Godzilla doesn't have eyelids. It looks Honestly, it looks like they, they made a really good attempt at making a new Godzilla and he looks really authentic, but it looks like he has googly eyes. For a part of it. It's not like it's that's the, the weirdest. Whole thing. It's the weirdest thing. He never like blinks. I know, but it's creepy. I don't think it's goofy. I, think I still it's just like creepy. the Gareth I still like the Gareth Edward Godzilla. He's a little big. He's in a the hefty midsection. boy. He's he's a hefty boy, but you know. <laughs> who am I to judge? Yeah. It's better than the nineties Godzilla though. That was the worst. Yeah. Fun fact about that one. The original owners of Godzilla bought the rights to that first American version just so that they could rename him Zilla and have the real Godzilla kill him. That sounds good. That's uh, yeah. 
That's that's some Japanese revenge right there, baby. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we did do some pretty rough stuff to him. So yeah. Well, that's a give and take sort of thing. But oh, anyway, wow. enough about that. Why do you always make faces like that, Annabelle? This is next history, thing I want to talk about before history, we get into this podcast because I'm throwing everybody under the motherfucking bus today. Oh Jesus! Is the fact that every time we get together. We have to deal with our soundboard and volume <laughs> problems, and I'm not talking loud enough, and Dylan sounds better, because Dylan's got a better microphone, and I bought a piece of shit microphone for our podcast, even though I bought the one that you told me to buy, Annabelle. And all of this trouble goes along, and it's all because we have this soundboard, and Annabelle won't read any information on how to run it. She won't watch any videos. It took me exactly five seconds to do a YouTube search and find a video, find like, there's like 20 videos on how to run this soundboard for podcasts, and she won't listen to any of them. She's stubborn. This is just like when I'm telling my kid to tie his shoelaces and he won't do it. I'm like, what is wrong with you? Tie your goddamn shoes before you leave the house. I don't want to tie my shoes. Oh my God. Buy your kid boots. Oh, he doesn't need boots. Oh my god. He just needs some Nikes. He's good with those. But anyway, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. That's my problem right there. Yeah, it's all of our problems. <laughs> it's all of our problems. My gears have You know been what grinds ground. my gears? That's from God. So it's, it's November, so we can start singing the Bob's Burgers Thanksgiving song anytime we want to. I love Bob's Burgers, and I love the Thanksgiving song. Bob's Burgers is great. Yeah, it is. But instead of doing that, why don't we do what we came here to do why don't we do what we came here to do so i know you've been excited about your story for a while you probably have a lot of information you've right. got a, a plan going i do so i'm gonna go first go ahead because i kept mine a lot shorter more to the point so that we could get to yours but i have a little something to add about mine so oh, shit yeah i'm so excited i'm gonna be talking about Old Alton's Bridge, also known as Goatman's Bridge. Oh, oh, Anna, even Annabelle's up. pumping her, pumping her hands up, That's raising right. the She's roof. Raising the roof. Right Hell now. yeah. Okay, so this is in Denton, Texas. It's a little north of Dallas and Fort Worth. Mm-hmm. So I mentioned earlier that I've been to Jefferson, Texas. Yes. And I'm gonna go back for New Year's, Christmas, New Year's time. And you're not taking me because you're a bitch. Not taking you. For many reasons, not just that you're a bitch. Thank you. Kidding. No, but anyway, it's the group of people that went the first time. So we're going to be going back to Jefferson for after Christmas New Year time. But I looked at Google Maps, and from here to Jefferson is about six hours. But if we go from here to Jefferson, or I mean, if we're at Jefferson and on the way back, we stop at this bridge, that's only an extra hour out of our way. So we're going to go visit this bridge, and I'm going to take pictures, and I sent Jake a picture earlier. There is a spirit box on Amazon that's like 70 bucks, and I'm hoping that we can like save up for it and split it, and I can use it here, since we threw away my Ouija board the last time they used it. Which we should. Which we should have. But anyway. Yeah, we definitely need to get the spirit box. I've told you already that we just need to go start selling plasma. I can't do that. I told you that. God damn you. So you two need to sell plasma. So I have to sell plasma. Why is it always me having to sell my body? <laughs> yeah, make Renee do it. That's not good. <laughs> no. That's not a fair trade. Anyway, so we're going to go to Jefferson, and then on our way back, we're going to go from Jefferson to the bridge, and we're trying to plan it out since daylight savings time just happened. It gets dark at like 6 o'clock. So yeah. we're going to try and get there around 7 o'clock-ish. So I'm going to be at this bridge at night. It's going to be super cool. I'm super excited. And that w- that is just my little tangent. Oh, so thank God. I love this story. I wanted you to tell me all about this story. I kept it pretty short. I've got kind of just the general, like the basics of it. I couldn't find a whole lot of like official history on this bridge, which is weird. But I do know that it was built in 1887. That's it. That's the story. Thank you all for coming. Have a great day. Is that it? Oh, great. That's the whole thing. No, okay. But it was built in 1887. And in 1938 was one of the first reports 
or I think the first report of the demon known as the goat man. And that's one thing that I thought was really interesting about this is that they don't call it just a ghost. They specifically say that it's a demon that haunts the bridge and the woods just past the other side of the bridge. So, and this is the demon referred to as the goat man. God, this sounds horrible. Oh, is going to be horrible. So when you go up to the bridge, you can't, you put your vehicle on it anymore. Vehicle traffic was stopped in 2001, but it is still open for pedestrian crossing. So if you go up to the bridge in the dark, like if you drive up to it and you turn your headlights off, or if you're on there and you like turn your flashlight off or whatever, supposedly in the distance, you can see glowing eyes, just creepy, I'm not down with that spooky in the woods or sometimes on the bridge. You can also usually see the silhouette of a half-man, half-goat. So it's like body of a man, but like goat legs and a goat head, which is just the worst. What's the name for that in Greek mythology? Isn't it a satyr? Yeah, satyr. That's it? Ooh, look at that. Yep, this is like Pan's Labyrinth sort of shit. Yes, like Pan's Labyrinth sort of shit. But worse! Rock-hard erection, holy crap. I'm hoping I don't see this guy. I do not need to see that in my life. All right. Sorry. I'm just saying. The goat man here has a rock hard erection. <sighs> Jacob, put your phone down. Okay. Sorry. Save for later. Jesus Christ. Okay. So the half man, half goat. You'll see that. Full um, erection. <laughs> and there's the title of our podcast. Half man, half goat, full erection. <laughs> okay. So goat man. Half man, half goat, full erection. There you go. Um, this will also happen if you go up to the bridge in your car, if you turn the lights off and you honk. But the big one is if you knock on the bridge three times, supposedly he's going to appear on the bridge or in the woods just past it. And that knocking is a way to basically like invite the demon to you. God damn it. Why would you again? Okay. All right. Here's the thing. Who in their right mind would do something so stupid? Why would you invite the demon? Don't invite that demon. I don't, don't know. Ask me name. when I come back and I knock on the bridge. Don't you fucking knock I'm gonna on fuck- the bridge. You really think I'm going to go to this fucking bridge and not knock on it? Because I know a little bit about this bridge. And I'm telling you right now, you better not bring that shit back over here. I'm going to knock I will knock. On I will write bridge. you out of my life before I let you do that. Yeah. I'm knocking on the bridge. Don't do it. Anyway. Another creepy thing about this is that supposedly there's like areas by the bridge where you can park. Um, Supposedly there have been quite a few abandoned cars that have been found at the bridge and the owners are just inexplicably gone. That's horrible. (laughs) Yeah, so they'll just find like abandoned cars here. No evidence of where the owners are at, anything. So that full erection got them. That sure did. Scooped them up. There have been a couple different versions of what people have seen at the bridge. Some people say the half man, half goat, obviously. Other people say that instead of that, they see a ghost of a man that is holding a goat head under each arm, which is just really creepy to me. Um, There's also a ghost man that is herding goats in the woods past the bridge. Right. I've heard about that one before. Yeah. Yeah. That one's not as creepy. It's a little weird, because, like, why are the goats ghosts, too? But, whatever. The half-man, half-goat is really creepy. Even the guy with a goat head under each arm is really weird, too. I'm I'm not digging that. Some of the really common things, besides seeing the goat man, have been people have reported hearing hoofbeats across the bridge at night, like, walking back and forth. No, thank you. Walking towards you. Um... Even, like, in the forest woods area behind the... Or just past the bridge. People have heard violence splashing from the river below as if somebody is drowning in the river. They've heard evil laughter. Demonic growling that happens from the woods and on the bridge. And they've heard demonic voices saying, Get off the bridge. Like spirit box or just like actual auditory? No, like actually hearing it. They hear a lot of things on spirit boxes. And I watched a couple videos of people going. But they've heard Goatman said they heard like a person's name. 
it's really really common in the spirit box and just when you're out there to hear screaming like people screaming from the woods see i've already had that experience at least people in my family have so i'm not even yeah I'm not about that life Mm-hmm. and you wonder why i don't invite you that's right anyway you never know when the disembodied scream is going to get you exactly the disembodied screams but it's also really common for people to be physically assaulted by nothing people have been pushed hit scratched scratches are really common there have been people that have been basically pulled off the bridge the three the three prong scratch yeah right? the three prong scratch the demonic scratch yeah, the demonic it it scratch is. the demonic scratch of course it is um and people getting pulled off the bridge into the water below or like thrown off the bridge uh pulled up against like the uh rails on the side just real creepy crap when you, when you go there you need to make sure you document all of this i will document everyone all needs this. to have their phone out yeah yeah we will i want to see some good shit i hope we will see some good shit and i will share all of it with you after i knock on the bridge i mentioned that the first sighting was in 1938 okay that stems from a supposed story that came from 1938 one of the legends of the origin of the goat man right was that there was an african-american goat farmer who worked near the bridge um and he actually was fairly wealthy for the time which you know the uh white people didn't care for right because white people are the worst they are the worst i can speak for all of us the scourge yeah um so anyway this goat farmer was attacked and killed by the kkk they hanged him from the bridge and then proceeded to murder the rest of his family that's what i heard too yes but the creepy part about this is when they came back they saw the rope where they hanged him from and his body was gone yes the story i heard about this bridge because mm-hmm. someone someone posted this on facebook not too long ago they had gone there and so i, I read a little bit about it but i heard the story too where they couldn't find his body yeah it, it would it just vanished they had no idea um where he went it is horrible that they murdered that in the, according to this origin story they murdered his family yeah but this story is actually pretty unlikely because there's no record of any goat farmer living there and you know if that were the case regardless why would that bring a demon there rather than just a ghost like if they just kind killed like- this dude and his family like yeah that would be horrible so i imagine it would be haunted by his ghost which it may well be but people specify that this place is haunted by a demon maybe it's like a pumpkin head situation a pumpkin head situation <sighs> maybe I, I just recently watched pumpkin head i had never watched that movie before really no. i saw it quite a while ago i don't remember a lot about it i like mean you, to rewatch it yeah but. i mean if you listen to my origin story left of last episode I didn't need any other reason to be scared at night. I already had enough that I didn't need to watch any scary movies. Yeah, I know. But I'm white, so I have to do dumb things. There you go. You're right. Bad decision engine right over there. That's what they call me. (laughs) Anyway, there are also a bunch of other official reports of cultists practicing rituals on the bridge and in the woods past the bridge. And there are a lot of ideas that you can find throughout the world that bridges tend to be gateways between dimensions so to have that on top of these cultists already practicing rituals and basically opening a gateway into evil you know it's just it's spelling bad news bears for everybody yeah you see that a lot i know i I know what you're talking about yeah and those are official report that's not just like right so that's like a police report where it's like we we, we got called to turn to disturbance and there was a giant bonfire a couple yeah. of hundred yards in the woods. And you know, maybe some dead there animals. And, and there was, you know, signs of rituals or hooded figures running away, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, I mean, that part is for sure. We know that that happened. Another really creepy aspect about this is the bridge itself is creepy as shit. But when you get off the bridge, if you enter into the wood area, that's when it gets more common for the unseen forces to assault you like the hits or the three scratches 
people are also flooded with emotions like horrible depression or anger, just violent urges, violent rages, no good emotion, but like a super heightened version of it. Okay, so you've already experienced a situation like that when you were at the Jefferson Hotel. Yes, I did. So obviously you were either receptive to it yep. or you just happen to be receptive to it at that moment. Yeah. What happens if it happens again in this in these woods? In um, Denton? Well, what then you going to do? What's your plan? What's I'm, your escape strategy? My plan is if this happens to me when I go there, then I'll just deal with it like I deal with those emotions on a day-to-day basis. I guess so. Do yeah. you want to wear my medal? My St. Michael medal? No, I'm okay. Thank you. I might protect you. No, I've got stick of good faith. I hope so. I do. So I'll be all right. But That's just not a name for your penis, right? No. No, that's the okay. name for my actual stick. Why you always make that face when I make jokes like that? <laughs> She's always like, mm, I'm going to edit that out. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You're not in charge of the editing. Exactly. (laughs) The stick of good faith. It's the stick of good faith. It was from Jefferson. Um, But anyway, I'm just going to deal with it. I'll have my protection walking stick. Um, But I, I, you know, I probably am susceptible to that kind of thing. So I just want to see what it feels like, you know? Mm -hmm. I want to get in there. I want to experience it. I want to feel it. And then I'm going to come back and I want to tell all, you know, seven of our listeners. Okay. Do um, so you have more about this? Yeah, just one more, one more little bullet. Um, I have some warnings. I've already read. I've already read some about it. Don't want to. I know. Throw in my two cents. Yeah, like I said, I really just tried to keep this to the basic points, the highlights of it. So this last point is, um, in the woods, the, like I said, the feelings of being assaulted or being overcome with these bad emotions are really common. You can also hear a lot of. EVPs and voices on spirit boxes. That's where, you know, like the screams, the different words, the names, all that kind of creepy shit goes on. You can also hear whispers and sounds like you're surrounded by people in the woods. That's not cool. I know. Like, if you're in there with a group of people and you can't see anything but trees around you, it'll sound like from all different directions there's somebody, like, shuffling back and forth. It's very Blair Witch. Very Blair Witch. I love Blair Witch. Every time I see Blair Witch, it makes me want to go camping. Oh, God. That's not even a joke. Every I time I see it, I actually went camping last it. weekend. Thank you for reminding me that. You're welcome. Uh, we should have watched Blair Witch beforehand. No, we didn't need to do that. Yeah. So anyway, you can also hear the evil laughter and hear the hoofbeats around you. And then there's the sightings of the creepy-ass goat man. Okay. The stories that I've heard are that if a person is overcome almost... And like I said, it's not possessed, it's more influenced. Once they're influenced by these by these strong murderous or depressive emotions, that they can have that follow them back home. Have you heard about that? Because I did, and you don't need to be bringing that shit back with you. I've heard a little bit about that, but... um, That it attaches to people. Let me break it down for you, son. I already got those emotions. Oh, my God. I'm bringing that bad juju with me all over the place. I'm ready to snap at an instant. I'm just saying. We're about to go from being just theorists to practitioners. Yeah, and I'm, I'm ready. I'm not sure you're up to speed with your defense against the dark arts. I'll have you know I've seen and read every Harry Potter, so I think I'm good. Oh, I don't know about that. But yeah, it's very scary. Yes, it is. Rumor has it that Ghost Adventures went there? Zach Baggins? Zach Baggins. That piece of shit. What a douchebag. God, I hate that guy. Did you guys hear about their, one of the producers, on, or one of the people that, I'll tell the story. Okay. Go ahead, tell the story, because I know the story too. Go ahead. So one of the people on the show has like a YouTube channel and they went into like this haunted house and he must edit his own videos. There's no way he has an editor that made this mistake, but he accidentally kept in the video a take two of a scary scene. And so he's like talking the story about how this house is haunted and he's in the basement and the guy is supposed to push a door to make it seem like a ghost pushed the door, but he pushes it too early and the guy's like, oh, we have to do it again. Make sure you do it when I say blah, blah, blah. And he kept that in the final cut. And then in the second video, they get it right, and he pushes the door on time, and the guy, like, freaks out, and he starts running with the camera, making it look real. And then to cover up and, like, cover up his butt and, like, make it seem like, oh, no, like that, I got hacked. That wasn't me. I didn't put that video up. 
he's like, I was hacked by a hacker. That wasn't me. That wasn't my video. So all of his, you know, like child subscribers would still think it's real. But yeah, every adult knows it's fake now. So now it questions the whole, like, what an the validity. Yeah, like, what if Ghost Hunters is all fake now? It's just people doing things on cue. Zach Baggins is definitely fake. Zach Baggins and his group there, they are the Kardashians of paranormal investigators. You're right. They really are. I mean, just attention whores. The absolute worst. The absolute worst. And even if they were legit, like, the way they approach everything, it's all super cheesy, the way they talk about everything, which I could deal with. But... They're just assholes. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, why are you going to be a douchebag to the ghost or the demon? What do yes. you get from that? And there's stories all about. I just, I'm on, I'm, I'm in a Facebook group and they were talking about this just recently. And they were talking about people who have actually had interactions with Zach Baggins and his group and how much of an asshole he is and how prima donna they are and how they just, they're rude to people where they go and they're rude to the fans and they're rude to the, you know, to, to the to the to the people who are running the places where they're investigating. Whereas we know paranormal investigators like here in San Antonio, shout out to Mike Gardenas and the Midnight Paranormal Society, who are the <laughs> best people in the world, who are super professional, very respectful, very knowledgeable, very reverent, just the best people. He was on I think he was on my essay. He was on daytime San Antonio morning show just on Halloween, on October 31st, talking about his investigations. They did a whole, like, I think he was on for like an hour or so. Hell yeah. It was great. It was awesome. He was so cool on that. I, I watched I, I watched as much as, of, of it that I could because I was at work at the, at the same time. But it was really cool. They, he was just on. Nice. So. But yeah, see, there's the difference in being, like, a good paranormal investigator and being a good guy versus being... A reality show star. Oh yeah, and, an and attention a douchebag. Whore. Yeah, attention whore. But um, I heard that they have an episode about the Goat Bridge to bring it all back. They do, and I made sure not to watch it. Oh, you should have. Apparently, shit happens. But whatever. It doesn't I, matter. Well, actually, I I watched like one clip where they supposedly see like eyes glow in the distance, and it was there, and it looked kind of spooky. But after hearing what Annabelle told me, I feel like that's just bullshit. Maybe but so. I specifically didn't watch the whole episode. That's fine. Um, Fuck those guys. Yeah. Bastards. Kardashians. Whatever. But anyway, yeah, so that was the high points of the uh, Goatman's Bridge. Speaking of Zach Baggins, not to give him any more power over us by mentioning his name, but he just had a live show on Halloween night where he was trying to... Um, Open the Dybbuk box, which he owns and yeah. has at his haunted museum in Las Vegas. Yeah, I know. It's supposedly super haunted. And, and apparently he, he went chicken shit and didn't open it up. That pussy. What an asshole. But also, I heard... I haven't looked at the article, but I've seen reference of Post Malone meeting with Zach Baggins and touching the Dybbuk box. And apparently Post Malone is cursed from it. That's what he gets. He's already cursed. Look at his face. Why would you do that to your own face? Stop it. Why would you do that to your own face? Oh, you mean him. Okay, I thought you were making another joke about me looking like Post Malone. No, I was talking about his face tattoos. Yeah, the face tattoos are not great. But also, so me and my mom were talking about Post Malone because she didn't know who he was. (laughs) Your mom is so sweet. (sighs) But we were talking about him, and I was like, yeah. And a bunch of people have told me that I look like Post Malone. And would you say, no, sweetheart, you are much more handsome than he is. That's not the point. Stop talking. Word for word, that's what she said, right? No. Didn't she? You're making that face like, you're trying to deny it, but that's exactly what she said. It was close to that. But that's not the point. The point is, we were talking about that. And I mentioned that people said I look like Post Malone. Then cut to later in the day when we're back at home... Mom mentioned something about it, and my stepdad, Jerry, was like, who's Post Malone? So we show him a picture, and before we can say anything, he goes, wow, Dylan, you look like this guy. And I went, god damn it! <laughs> no, but I uh, I was like, no, why would you say that? How do you know this? And he was like, what are you talking about? And we're like, we were just talking about how people say I look like Post Malone, and I hate it because I don't think he's a good-looking guy, especially with the face tattoos. But that was the first thing he said was, Hey, Dylan, you look like this guy. 
I was like, God damn it. Post Malone better be investing his money in something. Like buying out some Taco Bells or something. Because in six months from now, when the world has moved on and nobody's listening to his music anymore, he's going to have a hard time getting a job at a Taco Bell. You right. I mean, really, he's going to be slinging some bean and cheese tacos if he's lucky. You right. Once his star fades, he's no Lady Gaga. He's no Lady Gaga. We haven't he's gone... not going to be any in any Bradley Cooper movies. No, I was about to say, we haven't gone to see A Star is Born yet. Yeah. I don't know. Together. I've heard it's really good, but I don't have much motivation to see it. You bitch. Wow. Anyway. <laughs> are we ready for mine? Annabelle, are you ready? Are you ready, ready? She Pay attention, Annabelle. Get off your phone. I'm trying to find the, go- the fake ghost scene, but it seems like it was just wiped from the internet. I'll bet Zach Baggins wiped it from the internet because he's an asshole. And I'm like, where is it? Whatever. You you know what it reminds me of? And again, with the Zach Baggins. Fuck that asshole. They did the same thing. They made the same stink about Bear Grylls when he had his Man vs. Wild show. Oh, yeah. They talked about how he had scenarios that were just that were trumped up to make it look like he was in peril. So instead, because Bear Grylls is a solid motherfucker, he decided to put a disclaimer that said, sometimes these events are staged so that we can show how to respond in a crisis. And he still went hard for episode after episode. Yeah. Bear Grylls is actually... Bear Grylls is legit. Yeah, Bear Grylls is legit. All right. So anyway, now let's let's hear your story because I know you've been right. This excited is, about this. This is part two of a three-part series that we could probably sum up by saying everything the FBI does, does wrong. No, not really. Just the problems with the FBI. The FBI is at it again. Oh, the FBI is at it again. Okay, so last week, in last week's episode, we talk, I talked about Ruby Ridge and I talked about the standoff there and everything that went wrong. On both sides. It's not just, and this isn't just to rip the FBI or the federal government or anything like that. I mean, you know, like I said, like I said last week, there are hundreds, probably thousands of, you know, law enforcement officers that go about their day and do things exactly by the book and never get in trouble and never get the recognition that they need to and they keep us safe. And this isn't about any of those guys. No. This is about a specific, this is about a specific fuck up and, a couple of people that you know just made the wrong decision and how these things can just get snowballed and it just happens to be a noteworthy story so last week we talked about ruby ridge which happened in 1982 today we're going to be talking about david koresh and the um branch davidian compound oh god which happened in 1993 not even not even a year later so um david koresh was actually born in houston in 1959 and his name was vernon howell just to sum it up he, be- he eventually became the leader of the Branch Davidian sect in Waco, Texas, which they call it a sect. It kind of is an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which I'll discuss in just a minute. But there's a lot of there's a lot of talk about whether it was a cult or not. For, for our, for our uh, podcast, we're going to definitely categorize it as a cult, when the, and, and you'll see the reasons why. It's um, definitely culty. Oh, very culty. The Adventists are a Protestant group. And they teach some of the same tenets that other Protestant groups do, including uh, Christ is going to return someday. But they also, the reason that we call them Seventh-day Adventist is because they worship Christ. They worship God on Saturdays instead of Sundays because that's the last day of the week. They have a lot of dietary regulations. They, a, lot of them, a lot of them are practicing vegetarians. And they also, they also preach pacifism. And right then and there, that's where that's where these Branch Davidians go off differently. They have a lot of strict rules, like I said, about no tobacco, no dancing, no movies. Women use no cosmet- cosmetics. They wear they distinctive do. long dresses. Yeah. And I mean, we see people like that, not just the Adventists, but other, other strange cult sects. We're looking at you, Duggars. <laughs> of women who aren't allowed to wear jeans, who wear really long, flowy skirts, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So, as far as the Branch Davidians go, and, and especially the ones that were in Waco, Texas, it started all about, it started around uh, 1985, a, a, a man by the name of George Roden actually assumed, assumed the leadership of the, Debran- of the Branch Davidians there in Waco, and he started making these messianic claims about how he was the second coming of Jesus, and uh, that sort of thing. Vernon Howell, which is David Koresh, he was very persuasive within the group. He had tried to be a rock star. He had tried to be doing this and that. And even he eventually 
decided that he was going to be a preacher. So he became a part of this group and he led kind of a rival rival faction against George Roden. And this guy, George Roden, ended up kicking him out of the group. Something else that's that's interesting is that Koresh, when he was still Howell, began to have an affair with George Roden's widowed, widowed mother, even though she was like 40 years older than he was. Goodness gracious. Under the pretext that he was prophesied to follow the Messiah by her. That's another reason why George Roden kicked him out at gunpoint. Oh, wow. Right. Okay. They had to move to Palestine, Texas, which is spelled like Palestine, but we say Palestine here in mm-hmm. Texas. And they lived, I mean, they were like living primitive style, like no running water, no electricity out there in Palestine. Eventually, Damn. they got kicked out of there. But George Roden got himself into a lot of trouble. He and Koresh got into a gunfight at one point. They were shooting at each other. The sheriff's deputy got called. David Koresh and seven of his followers, because he was... He was gathering followers all this time. He was going all over the country, and he was even going internationally, of course gathering followers to his little flock. So he, he and seven other people were actually tried for uh, attempted murder, and none of them got convicted. They were all acquitted. David Koresh's uh, trial for attempted murder was, was uh, a mistrial mm-hmm. at the end of that. It's just crazy to think that all of this is happening, where they've got these exchanges of gunfire and all these other things. Yeah. So George Roden... Ended up in uh, in 1989 using an axe to kill another Davidian. Oh, Jesus. I know. Okay. He was found guilty under, un, guilty under an insanity defense and committed to a mental hospital in Big Spring, Texas. Which I've driven through Big Spring probably a thousand times. Because it's on the way to Lubbock. Where, oh, uh, okay. Where I was originally born and raised. So, I know where Big Spring is and I know where the state hospital is. But because of this... And because that guy got committed to that mental hospital, uh, Vernon Howell, David Koresh, Mm -hmm. uh, was able to secure control of New Mount Carmel in Waco and paid back taxes so that he ended up owning. He and his group and his religious organization were able to own and take leadership of that group of people. Okay. And Mount Carmel is right outside Waco. It's about 10 to 15 15 miles outside of Waco, real close. Howell perpetuated the, the the distinctive emphasis of the authoritarian leader. He controlled everything, all the aspects of their life. He wanted them to have an organization apart outside of society, so they had limited interaction. Um, only elders had the interaction, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. They were friendly to their neighbors, but it was definitely an us versus them. And they and he kept preaching that whole imminent end of the world apocalyptic sort of thing. In 1989, he released an audio tape in which uh, he says he was told by God to procreate with women in the group to establish a house of David, of special people. And this involved separating married couples, and they had to the men had to agree to be celibate, and the women were only allowed to have sex with him. I don't like and That's where this. it goes from being a Protestant organization to a cult, just like that. Yep. Um, Vernon Hell also felt like, in this, in this same tape that he was supposed to build an army of God to prepare for the end of days. In 1990, he decides to to legally change his name for publicity and business purposes to David Koresh. Okay. And the reason that he changed his name to David is because he felt like he was he was messianic and he was supposed to come from the house of David if if in case you didn't grow up in church, the reason that David is so important is because David is from the house of Judah. And so is Jesus Christ. They were ancestors to each other. Actually, you know, David was born and then and then Jesus was born generations afterwards. But cool, that's cool, why. Cool, 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 cool. So that's why he changed his name to, to David. And also the name Koresh comes from this uh, this King Cyrus who destroyed the Bab- Babylonians. He was a Syrian king who destroyed the Babylonians at a time when all the Israelites had been captured and sent into captivity in Babylon and then he destroyed the Babylonians and he allowed the Israelites to go back to their promised land and okay. resettle it. So he put some thought into his name. Yes, it was supposed to be super. Definitely put some thought into it. Yeah. Jesus. DNA evidence gathered after the whole event indicates that David Koresh had 13 children by seven different mothers. Goodness gracious. During, the, during his time as the leader of the Branch Davidian 
cult. Uh, of course he did. Okay, so things start to snowball. In 1993, the Waco Tribune Herald was sitting on a story, a series of articles that they wanted to publish called The Sinful Messiah. They were going to report allegations that Koresh was physically abusing children in the compound and committing statutory rape by taking multiple underage brides. God damn it, dude. They already had evidence that Koresh was an advocate of polygamy and that he was going around declaring that he was married. He had, he had already spoken about how he was entitled to at least 140 40 wives if oh he wanted to have them. The reason that everybody was so up in arms is because some of these brides were reported to be as young as 12 or 13 years old. God damn it. Mm -hmm. It's really disturbing. This is just going from bad to worse. Oh, yeah. Fronts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Koresh acknowledged on a videotape at one point that he had fathered more than 12 children, like I'd said earlier. During Bible study lessons, he was reported to tell inappropriate sexual stories to children and young girls. And that he was trying to preach that it was a privilege for him to have sex with children, uh, these girls, once they reached puberty. Which is just gross disgusting. and disgusting. Yeah. Again. Uh, adding to the cult, uh, the cult mentality. And these people were going along, a lot of the people were going along with it. There's also, they were also concerned, uh, authorities were concerned and the newspaper was concerned that there was physical abuse going on. Um, that they were getting, the children were being beaten with wooden spoons or that people were being withheld food as punishment. Wouldn't be surprising given the rest of what you've told me. Right, Exactly. Um, the other thing that the other reason that he came on the radar that the Branch Davidians came on the radar was because it was suspected that they were stockpiling illegal weapons. So uh, the McLennan County Sheriff's uh, Department at one point in 1992 called Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, ATF, mm -hmm. telling them that a local UPS driver had been delivering a package and it broke open while he was delivering it to him. And that the package had firearms, inert grenade casings, and black powder. Okay. Right. So, in 1992, the ATF opened up a formal investigation and kind of red flagged it so that everybody would understand that this is some serious shit going on in the Branch Davidian compound and everybody should be aware of it. And they started to try to dig up more information at this point. Okay. This is all happening in 1992. Not even six months after Ruby Ridge. This is starting to happen, just to give you an idea. Oh, God. Of what's going on. Okay. Two ATF agents um, visited the Branch Davidians gun dealer in 1992, a guy by the name of Henry McMahon. This is according to an article in Time Magazine. And try to get to talk, and they try to talk to Koresh over the phone. Koresh offered to let the ATF inspect the Branch Davidians weapons and paperwork, and also asked to try to speak to one of the ATF agents, but this ATF agent declined. Why would you decline? That? Exactly. Because Koresh was trying to say, not to say that he hadn't done anything wrong, and not to say that he's not in the wrong for some of this. But at this point, he's trying to cooperate. Uh, the sheriff, the McLennan County Sheriff, I, I say that so easily because I lived in Waco, so I know this I know this area. The McLennan County Sheriff told, told reporters afterwards, just go out and talk to them. What's wrong with notifying them? But the ATF began surveilling the house, the compound from a house across the uh, street. Mm -hmm. And it was so, their cover was... According to the Time article, their cover was noticeably poor. The college students were all in their mid-30s. They all had new cars. They were not registered at local schools. And they did not keep a schedule that would fit any legitimate employment or classes. Okay. So they were doing a shit job yeah. at trying to be secretive about this. Yeah. So um, ATF also tried to make a claim that Koresh was possibly operating a methamphetamine lab. Oh, boy. And this was so that they could, a lot of times, um, we don't have the War on Drugs Act anymore. What we have is the Patriot Act. Yeah. If you can, you can basically get a, what is it, a FISA warrant nowadays mm -hmm. and say, oh, we think these guys are, we think these guys are suspected terrorist activities. And what that does is that just ramps everything up. Suddenly, you can bring in the FBI, you can bring in NSA, you can ask for, you know, you can ask for wiretaps. You can ask to get into their computers. You are now access to federal funding. Well, back in the 90s, instead of having the Patriot Act, you had the War on Drugs Act, which did almost the same thing. Yeah, it just made everybody. Yes, get it makes hard every as a rock it makes everybody's this. dicks get hard. Exactly. So even though the ATFs were invest ATF agents were focused on firearms violation, 
The, the ATF requested assistance from the DEA and the DOD, the Department of Defense, yeah. citing a drug con- connection based on the recent delivery of chemicals and instruments and glassware. This comes straight from the warrant. Um, a written testimony from a for- former Compounds resident alleging that Howell had told him that drug trafficking was a desirable way to raise money. Several current residents who had prior drug involvement. Two former residents who were incarcerated for drug trafficking crimes. And in the National Guard's overflights thermal imaging showing a hot spot inside the compound, possibly indicating a methamphetamine laboratory. Okay. But. 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 This is total bullshit, and I'll tell you why. Okay. When David Koresh took over this compound from the former, um, the, from the former owner and cult leader, mm-hmm. they, um, part, of, part of the compound had been rented out to tenants, and the tenants actually had a meth lab there. And Koresh reported it to the sheriff's department and asked for all of it to be removed. Okay, so he knew it was going on and he made an effort to get that shit away. Right, so this is completely, it's it's completely trumped up. Okay. Okay, if he wanted to create a meth lab, why would he have reported that there was a meth lab already on the premises? He could have just kept the meth lab where he it was. He could have just kept it. He could have just kept it. Although the ATF preferred to arrest Koresh when he was outside the Mount Carmel, um, compound Mm -hmm. they received inaccurate information that koresh rarely left so they're already thinking that he's held up all the time the branch divinity members were well known locally they had cordial relations with other locals and their neighbors they partially supported themselves by trading guns at gun shows and took care to have relevant paperwork to ensure their transactions were legal they operated a retail gun business called the mag bag and they were signed all correctly um, the morning of the raid, later on, two of the branch, branch Davidian people were on their way to Austin to conduct business at a gun show. All right, but they're trying real hard to keep everything above board. Exactly. They're doing everything that they need to to stay legal. Okay. And, I mean, we live in Texas where every, you have to assume that everybody's got a gun. Yeah, that's Everybody's true. got a gun. Everybody's got a rifle. This is just how, that's how Texas is, you know? And yeah. Take it or leave it, better or for worse. That's just who we are. A lot of a lot of the reasons. I mean, there are a lot of people who shouldn't have guns, but at the same time, you know, we could walk into a Walmart and walk out the same day with a shotgun, or we could walk into um, Academy, which is only twenty minutes away, yeah. and you or I, both of us, as long as we had the money for it, it would take about fifteen or twenty minutes for us to buy an AR-15, fully functioning, and yeah. we'll let you buy the ammo at the same time. It's and a little ridiculous how is, easy it is. It but. is pretty ridiculous. I mean, and, and a lot of it just has to do with the way that our state is built and the legis- and the, the laws that we have, the laws that we don't have. Yeah. It's very common for us to see people have open carry, which is what, what they call it when you have a handgun on your person. Where you can basically rock in, out with your cock out. In plain sight all the time. And we work in a retail store that caters to old white men. And so we see it all the time. I mean, I mean you know, and I... All the three of us here, we work at the same place. We've all seen people with guns on their hips. Oh, yeah. Not a big deal. Not anymore. It just happens. It's just one of those things. Mm -hmm. Things were even more lax back then. So February 28th, 1993, the ATF decided to... they, They had this warrant, like I said. They decided to try to execute their search warrant on a Sunday morning. Now, they had been fighting with the Waco Tribune Herald on what day they were going to do this, what day they were actually going to execute this warrant Mm -hmm. so they were saying oh it's going to be this day it's going to be that day we're going to move it around because they didn't want the waco tribune herald running their sinful messiah newspaper article okay before because they went back and forth and because this thing was this whole plan was leaky like a fucking sieve um a local news reporter was tipped off and so he drives his stupid news van out there to try to get the scoop on the raid and asks a U.S. Postal Service mail carrier for directions to the Branch Davidian compound. Of course he does. The U.S. Postal Service mail carrier happens to be Koresh's brother-in-law. Oh, God damn it. Yes, it's so stupid. So the Branch Davidians knew they were on their way. The survivors of the standoff told people that Koresh ordered a select group of men to begin arming themselves and taking up defensive positions, while the women and children were told to take cover in their rooms. 
Now, despite being found, being informed that the Branch Davidians knew a raid was coming, the ATF commander ordered the raid to go ahead. Of course he did. Even though, you know, their whole plan was to be was to have the element of surprise before anybody could be armed and prepared. So, so fucking So they stupid. just decided, oh, well, oh, let's well, fucking do it anyway. Let's just do it. Let's just do it live like a bunch of fucking morons. We'll do it live. We'll do it live. Okay. Now, if you want to know more about this, and this is where I got a lot of information, there is a very good documentary about it called Waco, The Rules of Engagement, which, again, is just one of these ones where it makes the ATF and the FBI look horrible. For... You know, honestly, they make themselves look horrible. Yeah, I mean, they've got no one. Like this. Yeah, it's not like it's a smear can. It's not very hard to make them look bad in this situation. So, of course, just like in Ruby Ridge, there's two, there's two versions of the story. ATF agents state that they heard shots coming from within the compound. Branch Davidian survivors claim that the first shots came from the ATF agents outside. Um, some people say that it was an accidental discharge of a weapon, possibly by an ATF agent who was just gun happy, had buck fever. Um, other reports claim that the first shots were fired by the ATF dog team. Apparently the ATF has a quote unquote dog team. They, they um, killed the dogs of the, in the Branch Davidian kennel to try to um, get the element of surprise. What a bunch of assholes. So fucking stupid. The ATF had three Army National Guard helicopters that they were using as an aerial distraction. And all these three helicopters took, return fi- took incoming fire without, turning, without returning fire. But at some point, they all stopped and they, they landed somewhere else. Okay. Um, during the first shots, Koresh was wounded. He was shot in the gut and on his left side. And within a minute of the raid starting, Branch Davidians um, called emergency services, called nine one one, pleading for uh, pleading for somebody to stop shooting. Jesus. And uh, we and there's there's all sorts of audio for this. It's so horrible to listen to. Um, let me give you a let me give you a, a blow by blow of what happened. The first ATF casualty was an agent who made it to the west side of one of the buildings before he was wounded. Agents quickly took cover and fired at the buildings while helicopters began their diversion and swept low over the complex. The Branch Davidians fired on the helicopters and hit them without injuring the crew, but the helicopters immediately immediately stopped and landed. On the east side of the compound, agents hauled out two ladders and set them up against the side of the building. Agents then climbed up onto the roof with the objective of securing the roof to reach Koresh's rooms and the arms storage. On the west slope of the roof, three agents reached Koresh's window and were crouching beside it when they came under fire. One agent was killed and another was wounded. Now, this is the part. If you go and watch YouTube, you can watch video of this. This was on CNN. This was on everything yeah. when this happened. I remember my dad just being so upset watching it because it was like, he was watching it from the from the eyes of an infantryman in the United States Marine Corps, saying these dumb, these dumbasses are up there and they're just getting they're getting ambushed, they're getting massacred on TV because yeah. they were obviously they were obviously not prepared for the assault. They were not prepared. I mean, like I said, there's a clip of a guy and he's on a roof, and one guy falls off the roof, and then you can you can see bullet holes. I mean, big motherfucking bullet holes. Through the sheetrock and through the outside siding, coming from inside the building out to shoot at the shoot at the guy, and he just—I mean—he does everything he does he can because he's already wounded once yeah. to crawl off the building and fall down. Oh Jesus Christ! To get away from the shooting, it's horrible. They were throwing stun grenades in there. Three in, three agents entered the room when another tried to follow him. A hail of bl- bullets penetrated the wall and wounded him. But he was able, like I said, he was able to reach a ladder and slide to safety. An agent fired with a shotgun at Branch Davidians who were shooting at him until he was hit in the head and killed. Oh, damn. Inside the armory room, the agents killed a Branch Davidian gunman and discovered a cache of weapons, but came un- then came under heavy fire, and two of them were wounded. After they escaped, the third agent laid down covering fire, killing a Branch Davidian. As the third agent, the last guy trailing, made his escape, he was hit in the head on a wooden support beam and fell off the roof but survived. An agent outside provided covering fire, but was shot by a Branch Davidian and was killed instantly. Dozens of agents took cover, many behind Branch Davidian vehicles, and exchanged fire. The number of ATF wounded increased, and an agent was killed by gunfire from the compound. The exchange of fire continued for about 45 minutes until the ATF just ran out of ammo. 
So this is just a big old shit show it where everybody's just, shooting I mean, everybody. God. This sounds like a big mess. Mm-hmm. 45 minutes goes by. Four FBI agents are dead. Six Branch Davidians. I don't know, actually, ATF agents, but you get the idea. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Just that's too horrible. many deaths. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Okay, so here's where it gets really... I mean, if you don't, if you think that this has already been fucked enough... Oh, does it get better? Oh, of course it gets better. Of course it then, gets better. Then the FBI takes command of the situation from the ATF. Of course they do. Um, they get the special agent in charge from the San Antonio field office, becomes the site commander, and then <laughs> the FBI's hostage rescue team, straight from Ruby Ridge, their dick's still wet from that fuck up, Oh my God! show up to try to make the situation even worse. Their commander, Richard Rogers, which I didn't mention, was the leader of the hostage rescue team at Ruby Ridge. And he's there in Waco. Of course he's there in Waco. Somehow, this motherfucker still has his job, even though he fucked it up in in Idaho. Jesus Christ. So, um, they reported afterwards, after everything's done, that just like at Ruby Ridge, Rogers often overrode the site commander and mobilized both teams of the hostage rescue tactical teams at the same time. This created pressure to resolve the situation tactically. It's just like everybody wants to go in guns blazing. Everyone wants to kill somebody. You know, you've got the worst you've got the worst federal agents in the world over here and they're all hanging out together and they're all getting their dicks hard thinking about how many guys they're going to kill. This sounds spectacular. Oh yes. Like the absolute best way to handle this situation. Mhm. So then the then the FBI um the FBI sends in their negotiators, their hostage negotiators, and they um they give a phone with a direct line and they start talking to David Koresh. They made an agreement with him that everybody was going to surrender peacefully and leave the compound unarmed if they let him record a message and broadcast it on national radio. So they go ahead and go on with this demand. The broadcast was made, but then Koresh tells negotiators that God wants him to stay in the building and wait. Okay. Right? Despite this, soon afterwards, negotiators managed to facilitate the release of 19 children, ranging in age from 5 months to 12 years old, without their parents. So at this point, there's still 98 people still in the building. And now you just have a bunch of kids separated from their families. Yes. Now, here's the part, here's the part where it gets personal for me. Because those children who ended up, these children and some of the ones who were released later on, ended up um, going through Child Protective Services, and then they were placed at a children's home in Waco called the Methodist Children's Home, where I worked this happened in 1993. I started working there in 2001. So it wasn't even 10 years. It was only eight years later. Okay. Some of the home parents that lived at the Methodist Children's Home remembered this standoff and remembered having these kids. Mm. And if you watch the uh, Netflix Waco, um, the Waco docu- documentary, you can see some of these kids playing on this playground equipment. And it's at that children's home. Like, I recognize the building. I recognize the home unit where they're playing at. Oh, wow. It's just so creepy. That is real weird. Yeah. Not only that, but the Methodist Children's Home operates within city limits, but they also have a boys' ranch where they have other kids, and they've got a horse ranch out there. They've got cattle. It's only about two minutes away from the Branch Davidian compound. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Like you, drive about, you drive about 15 minutes outside of Waco, or at least it was back when I was working there, and you go down this one road, and it's like, if you take a right, you go to the Methodist Children's Home Boys Ranch. But if you take a left, you go to the Branch Davidian compound. But they won't let you. Now i got to go home and take a shower, because that one made me feel dirty. Gross. And I'm excited for the next one, too. Yeah, because this is a three-parter. This is a three-parter. That's what you've been teasing for quite a minute. <laughs> it quite only a minute? For quite a this. while. It only, it only, I mean, you think this one was bad. This one was bad, but. The next one. I'm really excited for the next one. I got to figure out what I'm going to do for the next one. Mm-hmm. I know you mine know, this time was real short. Not as good as some of my others, but. Yeah. My next episode, we're going to call it The Federal Government Gets Theirs. <laughs> Jesus. So you'll just have to wait and see what that is. About fucking time. Exciting. Exciting. Dylan, you have anything left? Um, You left it all on the field? Oh, actually, no. I do want to say something real quick. Um, since... Before I came here, I had to go pick up a computer monitor for my stepfather, Jerry, because his broke. And so my mom was like, hey, since you're going to be out anyway, here's $20. Can you just go pick it up for me? And she sent me the address. I was like, yeah, sure, that's fine. I'll go, I'll go do that. So 
I went and got food for me and our coworker Darcy. Shout out to Darcy. And then I just went to this area. I plugged in to my GPS. My GPS sent me a block further away from where I was supposed to be. So I was like, all right, yeah, I'm here. I, you know, park the car, get out. It's like 630. It's dark. Because of daylight savings. Because of daylight savings time. And I'm walking out there and I've got my phone in my hand trying to find this address. And three big dudes just walk out from their backyard. And they're like stereotypical like hispanic are they hold on are they my people no they're like the stereotypical hispanic gangster guys okay like pants way down with the boxers way up the dude that was in front there was three of them the dude that was in front was wearing a button-up shirt that was completely unbuttoned and didn't have anything on underneath so it was just his stomach and then there were two dudes behind him one of them had like a hat or a do-rag or something on but the two guys behind him had their hands behind their back holy shit yeah they were holding guns in their waistbands she say no don't worry don't shoot on post malone no i didn't say that that would have got you something they probably would have let you smoke a bowl with them probably but no i was walking and the two guys behind him looked mad and this first guy came up and was like hey can we help you with something and i was like yeah, sorry, I'm just looking for, you know, this address. It was in the 200s. And they were like, yeah, you got the wrong place. This is the 100s. 200s is going to be another block. Did you mom send you to the fucking Lindy's or something? My mom sent me to the fucking ghetto of New Braunfels that apparently where we have. Where were you? It was not too far from here, Annabelle. Yeah, but where? Yeah, it was in that little more ghetto area. You're talking about... You're not only are you talking about the neighborhood where I lived, but you're talking about the neighborhood where my wife and I delivered newspapers in the middle of the fucking night for four years. Okay, well, that's different. You were a Hispanic What's the address? newspaper address? Tell me guy. the address. We'll bleep it out. We will bleep it out. The address I was looking for was... <laughs> I got sent to... That ain't nothing but a thing. I know those people. Those are my homies. Okay, well, I didn't know those people, and they came up to me very upset. I could walk over there and be like, what's up, motherfuckers? Yeah, I can't do that. What's going on, putos? I'm a sketchy-looking white boy. That's hilarious. Wandering through their neighborhood. So they got mad at me, or they they sounded real mad. Like I said, the two guys behind this guy had their hands behind their backs like they were holding what I assume was a gun. I'm pretty sure they didn't have, you know, a nice good book. Probably not. They were. They did not have the Book of Mormon. No. Behind their back. Can no. we tell you a story about our Lord and Savior? Yeah. So they they were mad at me. And they were like, "No, that's in a different area. This is the one hundred. So you're too far." I was like, "Okay, thank you. No problem." I get in my truck. I reset my GPS to find me the right spot. So I go a different way. Circle around. Finally, find this house that I'm looking for. Talk to this generic white dude, and he's like, "Yeah, here's the." computer monitor works fine 20 bucks so i hand him the money i get this computer monitor that's way bigger than i'm expecting and i'm waddling off of this porch i put it in my truck as i'm putting it in my truck i'm hearing a loud engine like car or truck Uh engine and it was those guys yeah i put the fucking monitor in there i close the door this truck is speeding to me stops like slams on the brake right in front of me it's the guy that came out in front that had his shirt unbuttoned right. and his windows are all down. He was like, Hey, you find what you're looking for? And I was like, yeah, found it. Thank you for your help. GPS just sent me to the wrong area. He's like, yeah, my homie's ready to kick your ass. But I was like, nah, I'm going to, I'm going to see what's up. I was like, I appreciate that. And then I got in my truck and he left and I left. So I almost got shot. You're talking about the area where I'm telling you, man, threw newspapers in there for four years, middle of the fucking night. Yeah. No problem. I'm sure you're fine. You know, some of the best neighbors we ever had in the duplex that's across the street from our from our place were meth heads. Really? Because every day when I would get I would I would try to be as quiet as I could, close and lock the door, go to my car. And as I'm walking to my car to go deliver newspapers, two o'clock in the morning, someone would always come out of the house and I would wave at them and they'd wave back. And I'm like, you know what? The meth heads across the street, them tweakers are making sure no one no one messes with my house. Yeah, I'm sure they're great. They're 24 hours. If security. you know them, yeah, it's the best. It's better than Brinks. I didn't have to pay any money. Exactly. But these guys were not meth heads, or at least didn't look like the typical white boy tweaked out meth heads. They just looked like angry Hispanic dudes that were ready to fucking kill me. They did not look happy at all. They did not sound happy. They came at me very menacingly, and I was like, "Sorry, not looking for this area. Oh, you not poor trying baby. to cause trouble." You poor baby. 
if I'm gonna get fucking killed by some random people in the New Braunfels ghetto, it's gonna be on my terms. All right, I'm not gonna die for a twenty dollar TV monitor oh my God. or a fucking computer monitor because his burnout. Oh Jesus Christ! We I have one. You could have I could have bought it. I could have sold it to you. Son of a bitch! You didn't tell me anything. Imagine the gravestone for you. <laughs> right, stupid ass white boy got so shot scary. looking. No, I'm sorry for that terrible story. Yeah, so that was that. That was awesome. But anyway, so that's been my night. Good times. Yeah, that's fucking crazy. I love it. So tell your friends when you're delivering newspaper not to shoot the sketchy white boy. Yeah, I don't go there anymore, but yeah, I'll, I'll let him know. <laughs> Thanks. I'll, I'll pass it along. Thanks. <laughs> Annabelle, you got anything? Mm-mm. That was wild. God All right. damn it. So from Dylan and Annabelle and myself, we want to thank you for listening, and we hope that we have left you too scared to sleep. <laughs> you see us recording, right? He doesn't care. It's his world. No, I'm just, just kidding. With you. It. It's fine. We'll just edit it out. It's yeah. all right, baby boy. You mean I'll just so edit sorry, this out? Mom. It's all right. No, it's fine. I'm just messing with you. Yeah, the only reason I said what I said is so we can put it in the outtakes. Yeah. Oh, oh so y'all like basically make fun of me. Y'all talking shit. No. No, Jake's the only one that talks shit about you, baby boy. You know what? Okay. <laughs> Do you want anything to eat when I come back, sweetie? Did y'all get all that? Yeah. And no, thank you, honey. I'm I'm good. Yeah. Okay. I have a box of mac. He was talking to me. I was talking to that guy. Who you you got a box of mac in there? <laughs> a box I, of mac. A box of mac. Ba da ba ba da ba ba. Oh damn it. <laughs> What Did is this noisy us? boy doing? I don't know. He's just walking through, opening all the doors, acting a fool. Yeah, yeah. I can do that because I'm going to have to cut all the- Who in their right mind, other than dumb white people, would do this sort of thing? And I don't care how I dumb sound white right people. now. No, you're right. You're absolutely white. right. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. Hello, Dr. Freud. Ah, oh, son of a bitch. No, you're absolutely right. Just um, cut it out. Here we go again. We're not going any further in our physical relationship until you take me to go see A Star is Born. Looks like we're not going any further. Wow. Just like my wife. No. Yeah. Edit that out, I swear no, to God. No, I'm keeping that you in. You better edit that out. I'm fucking keeping that God in. Damn you. you-